Okay, looks like we are close to being okay with all of our tech. I've got Facebook going here and YouTube going here. Hope you guys can see and hear me today. Uh, we've got a fantastic audience. Hi, Brian. Yes. <laughs> uh, so um, we're just going to talk about fish. Okay, that's better. I think we're back up here. I went on a different connection. Um, so back to what I was talking about. What is a steelhead? So steelhead, um, we're talking Great Lakes is, um, steelhead. It's a debate in itself. There's some people that say that only steelhead um, are fish that move from freshwater to saltwater and then come back to freshwater. Uh, where our Great Lakes fish are only in freshwater. The Great Lakes are huge bodies of water. So here in Pennsylvania, we've got Lake Erie, a very small amount of the lake that actually touches Pennsylvania because we've got that you know big rectangle and the little tiny square on the top that's actually Erie. Um, but close to us, we've got Lake Michigan and Lake Ontario uh, that all hold, uh, they both hold salmon and steelhead. So a steelhead genetically is exactly the same as a rainbow trout. The big difference for them is they are um, either born in the stream, stocked in the stream as very small fish. They go out to the lake for three years and then they come back. Um, so we call them Andronomous fish as they're migratory, um, where most of your trout are going to be resident fish, where they are uh, sitting in the same area, the same run. They might move a little bit here and there, um, but overall they stay in the same general area and they don't move a whole lot. So the big thing with the steelhead is they, we've actually seen some reports in the last two or three weeks um, that they're starting to come into the system, both in Ohio and Pennsylvania locally. And then I keep track of Lake Ontario because I do some salmon trips up there in the fall. Um, and they're starting to see kings, they have king salmon, coho salmon, steelhead, brown trout that are actually lake run as well. Erie gets a few brown trout, not a ton. Um, and then they've got uh, some Atlantic salmon too that run through there. So we're running through there. Um, <laughs> I'm just seeing some messages there, Rich. Uh, you can still stop by if you want to, if you're working uh, down the road. But anyways, so the big thing with these fish is they're constantly moving. Uh, where when you find a fish in a pool, I mean, I know people that have targeted the same fish and caught them, you know, year after year in the same pool. You know, brook trout are kind of notorious for that. You, know, you find this big deep pool and you catch this fish that's you know six inches one year and seven inches the next year and you know you can kind of tell by the markings um, that it's the same fish over and over again where these steelhead uh, they might be a mile up in an hour um, there's been people that have attempted to track how far they move in a given day and they can move five to ten miles easily in a given day so these fish uh, typically they come in in the fall when they get colder water temperatures and enough rain to kind of raise the water system up. Um, Lake Erie has the smallest drainage basin as well as the most shallow of the Great Lakes. So it kind of doesn't, the, the steelhead in, in Erie particularly, talking because of our local, um, local shop here, uh, don't get as big as some of the other Great Lakes. So that being said, an Erie steelhead, like I just saw one posted that was caught yesterday that was 11 pounds, six ounces, which is just a monster. Uh, your typical Erie steelheads, 22 to 28 inches, maybe four to eight pounds. Um, so those are three year old fish. They go out to the lake for three years and then they come back. Uh, and then uh, you'll occasionally get a four year or a five year fish. And then you also get one year fish. Uh, I, I always laugh because there was a guy I steelhead fished on a, with a big group a number of years ago and he caught one and his name was Jack. And he looked at me completely honestly. He goes, what do you call a one-year-old steelhead? steelhead? And, and it's called a jack. <laughs> so that was his name, and he didn't know the answer. So I always laughed at that. And it just makes me think about that story every time, uh, every time I talk about it. Um, so the big thing that we need to talk about when we're looking at uh, targeting these fish um, is how they're, different, how they're different in terms of moving so much and how we approach that. Um, so we'll talk about how we target them in the water. Let's talk, let's talk first about um, where, we, where we do, uh, where we look for them, um, 
what kind of gear we use, what kind of flyers we use, and then we'll see specifically like what kind of structure or stream um, characteristics that we're looking for when we're, we're trying to catch steelhead and be more successful than other types of water that you still might even find fish in. So let's talk gear first. Um, here in Lake Erie, I would say anywhere between a nine and a 10 foot six to eight weight. Uh, most people will say like a 10 foot seven weight's the perfect Erie steelhead rod. Uh, I can't necessarily disagree with that, but uh, for me, the longer that I fish, the more I want to. Um, thanks Rich, the best way to catch them is with a net. You can only do that in trout run. And you can't get in trouble there because then you're not, uh, you know, you're not catching with a rod and reel. Nang, Nang, thanks for the food today, Nang. Everything was great as usual. Um, I'm gonna have to work on my YouTube stuff later because it just kicked me out. Um, yeah, we all had uh, lunch from Nang at Crazy Tie down in Beaver Falls today, and it was great. Pin for the win, he says. We're gonna do me and you, Nang. We're gonna do a, a pin versus fly day and see who catches more fish this year. So we'll. Uh, We'll see who wins that battle. Um, but anyways, gear, six to eight weights, nine to 10 feet rod, 10 foot rod. Uh, depending on where you're fishing, sometimes that might vary. There's definitely um, a lot of different water, both in Ohio and Pennsylvania, where Lake Erie comes in. Uh, Ohio has some bigger tributaries when you're looking at uh, the Grand, you know, appropriately named compared to some of the PA tribs. Um, in Pennsylvania, the Elk, uh, Elk Creek, Walnut Creek um, are the two biggest. Those are both on the west side of Erie. And then the east side, they're typically named after all the miles. Um, Rich says he won't win. Yeah, maybe we'll, maybe we'll put some money down on that one or a box of flies that uh, he can tie for me. Um, the mile streams are a little bit smaller. And you know, some of those you can jump across. Um, uh, 12, 20, 16 mile, eight mile, seven mile, you know, all those, all those streams on the east side, uh, they don't get as much pressure because they don't have as many huge parking lots and things like that, but uh, more people are, are fishing those in the last handful of years too. Um, he won't win, I won't win, we're playing to Nang. Okay, um, so looking at rods, uh, you definitely want something, most of our fishing is done swinging flies, especially early season can be very successful with that. These fish can be very, very aggressive. So you can swing and strip streamers in. Um, and even on days where, you know, it might be 30 degrees and then all of a sudden it raises to 35 in a day. Sometimes that little temperature rise um, can, <laughs> uh, I'm not spot burning. Um, that temperature rise can turn the fish on and be very aggressive. So, you know, we're dead drifting nymphs and eggs. We're even dead drifting streamers like woolly buggers or white deaths or zonker patterns. Um, we can be swinging flies. Um, I think my goal this year is to get one top water. Uh, I'm probably gonna tie some bomber patterns where you, you swing through the top um, on the surface. So that's one of my big goals this year. I might try to do that here in the next few weeks. Uh, early season steelhead can be a little bit, uh, be a little bit more aggressive just because of the warmer water temperatures. So rods, you're in that category. Reels, in my opinion, um, depending on how brave you are or how much you want to fish for these things, uh, you want a sealed drag. I've fished up there in sub-freezing temperatures without a sealed drag or had other buddies do that, and literally it freezes up on you. Um, so your solution to that problem is take your reel and dip it into the water and unfreeze the drag system and then it just freezes back up on you. So a sealed drag, if you plan on fishing in any below um, water or below freezing water uh, temperatures, uh, it's a good idea to have a sealed drag up there. Um, I would say when you're looking at most salmon and steelhead fishing, an average rod and an above average reel are, are more important. Compared to trout fishing, most of the fish that you're catching trout fishing, you're gonna hand line in, you're rarely using the drag system on your, on your reel. They're just line holders, if you ask me, for 95% of the fish that you catch. Where steelhead and salmon, you're using the reel probably on 75 plus percent of those fish. Um, so it's more important to have a better drag system on there um, and make sure that you're knowing how to handle that. So we'll talk about that. Um, other gear that you're using, uh, fly lines. Most of your fishing can be done with a floating line. 
Uh, one of the things that we've brought into the shop and I've suggested a lot in the last handful of years is a sinking poly leader. So that allows you, it just has a loop on each end. I think ours are seven and a half feet long. So if you go into a situation where you need, you have a deep pool or your fishing flies a little differently, um, you can just add that on the end of your, your floating line and now you can be able to get your flies down better. Um, if you're swinging flies or you know whatever your technique is there. So those, um, those poly leaders are huge to be able to add and subtract on throughout the fishing without having a full floating and a full sinking line and having to change over reels. Um, that's been nice to kind of um, be adaptive as you're moving, uh, moving around. Uh, your leader system for most of that, it doesn't have to be complicated, whether it's a, um, a regular tapered leader or you're building it out. Uh, most of my fishing is done nymphing, so I like to incorporate probably about a two foot indicator section. Um, a lot of guys like floating indicators. I like an inline indicator for most of my fishing, which is just a colored section of line. We have some stuff there. I think I built you one, didn't I, for trout fishing maybe? Yeah, so we've got one with a couple different colored sections. Um, so that's important uh, just to be able to see any sort of change. So as your colored indicator is going down the, the stream, um, any sort of tweak or movement on there is a hook set. Um, so we throw that in the middle there. And usually I'm running a heavy piece of mono, maybe 20, 25 pound test, uh, running that indicator uh, tippet there and then a barrel swivel or a tippet ring, and then running your, um, yeah, I got all of you, thank you. <laughs> Brian's laughing. Um, and then uh, running your tippet material off of there. Depending on the depth of the water, you might run anywhere from two to six feet of tippet material. Um, we're gonna talk about water conditions. I was gonna talk about that now, but we'll discuss that later. Uh, and then in Pennsylvania, I know the rule used to be three flies max and they've eliminated all of that. So you can fish a hundred flies if you want to. For me, it's one or two. Um, I rarely run anything more than that because these steelhead run, they jump, you know, they take big runs off of you. Uh, when there's a bunch of fish in the stream, you get a lot of snags. So you trying to redo a, a rig that has more than two flies on it, you'll spend more time re-rigging than you will fishing. Um, so typically most of my rigs are I'm swinging a streamer, sometimes two streamers, or I'm running a double nymph, double egg, or one nymph and one egg rig and, uh, and just drifting those. Um, so that's my typical setup. The other things that I'm going to need on top of that, um, just put them in a tree, just like your t-shirt. Thanks, Rich. Um, that's your specialty. So, um, the other things that you're going to need... Um, gear wise, I always say split shot. I don't like the little dinky fly fishing split shot that you have there. Uh, hey Nick, sorry we uh, can't connect anymore because you moved back down south, but Nick is going on our salmon trip here in a couple weeks, so he's pretty excited for that. Um, get the regular water gremlin, whatever brand split shot with the wings on them. I use anywhere from like the, I got a 500 pack of like B's and double B's that I use a lot for up in Erie because um, the little tiny ones that you get in the you know the the spin around open they've got some that are like this big and others that are you know a hair bigger than that those are worthless in my opinion um, so sometimes I'm using two three four of those tiny split shots and maybe putting them on uh, different places to be able to get my rig down because uh, in my opinion some of the best fishing is when the water's a little bit up so you want some split shot to get your flies down so you want some split shot. You want to make sure that you're carrying um, fluorocarbon leader. Uh, it's a little bit more abrasive resistance. It's a little bit tougher. Um, and fluorocarbon sinks and monofilament floats. So I'm not throwing any floating flies for 99% I'm going to try this year, but that's a whole different story. Um, so use fluorocarbon. I think it's worth it in these situations. Anywhere from when the water is super low and clear. Hey, Nick. Um, I might throw 5X. That's very rare, but that's probably the lightest I go. My typical is three. Um, in normal conditions, I'm throwing three. If it's super light, I'll step down to four, uh, low in water. If they're refusing that, I might step down to 5X, which you're still gonna lose some fish, but hopefully you hook a few more. And then vice versa, if the water's up and you can get away with it, step from that 3X to 2X, 1X, 0X, um, because if you can afford a heavier leader and still hook into fish, you'll be able to land those fish quicker. 
um, if you're catching release, be able to revive them quicker and, uh, and put them back in the water. Um, we'll talk about harvest and all that stuff later as well. So we've got all the gear that you need. Other things, when I fish for steelhead, I'm, I'm out all day and I'm carrying a backpack or some sort of huge pack with water, lunch, snacks, a raincoat, uh, weather changes up on Lake Erie, very much like the ocean, where you might see low, calm, no waves on the water, and then an hour later there's you know four foot waves and white caps on everything. Um, so be prepared for weather whenever you're out. Um, I prefer um, studs in my boots when I'm walking through there. A lot of the shale is very, uh, very slippery, so it's important to have good footing there. Um, I don't use a wading staff in, in Pennsylvania or Ohio. I do in New York because the Salmon River that we fish is just atrocious. Um, I think uh, Rich is getting in trouble from his wife. Um, other things that I'm bringing with me, um, chapstick, sounds silly, but chapstick is great when, first of all, you know, when the wind's blowing, I use it for my chapped lips, but when the temperature drops and your eyelets on your rod start to freeze, uh, chapstick keeps the water off of it, so it keeps some of it from freezing. It's almost impossible to keep that going all day long. I've known guys who are like, oh, I use Pam cooking spray, like, well, that's gonna ruin everything, so don't do that, but a little bit of chapstick, and there's a couple companies out there that make a product. I think Loon has an ice off, is what they call it, um, and there's a few other things out there, but a simple dollar store chapstick that I throw in my pack. Um, works well for that. Split shot, extra liters, extra tippet material, like I said. I'm typically running like 4X to 2X. Um, those three will kind of cover perfect for me. And um, and then extra indicator material, tippets, split shots. Um, I'm blanking on the word. Uh, swivels or um, tippet rings are great. Um, some people carry an extra reel. I don't think it's really important unless you're carrying a, you know, a cheap reel that you think might blow up on you from being used too much. Um, but we've got some good reels here you can use. And other little things, I think most of the other stuff is just optional. You know, uh, you want all your regular tools that you're carrying, your nippers, your hemostats, some sort of pliers. Um, one thing, I was talking to some guys that fished the Salmon River for a couple of years and didn't bring a net or they were having trouble ca uh, using uh, or, or taking pictures. So we have these tailing gloves, which are great, just for holding on to fish, whether you're trying to release it or take a picture. So all it is is like a mesh net material that you put over so you've got a better grip compared to just grabbing onto the fish. So the best way to hold these fish, whether it's for pictures or anything else, is to have one hand around the base of the tail. You know, so you've got the tail that kind of comes up right where the adipose fin is. Um, so hand around and grab it around the base of the tail and the other one is under the belly. You know, we're not sticking our fingers in the gills. Um, that's how those fish breathe, especially if you're reviving them. We don't want hands in the gills. Um, I'm probably going to see pictures of people like that and I'll reprimand every single one of them. If you're sending that fish back, then don't touch that. <laughs> Put your hand on their belly, hand around the base of the tail, take your, take your picture back in the water, revive them. Um, in terms of reviving, uh, this isn't like a typical trout where you're going to bring it in in 15, 20 seconds and let it go and they're still, you know, full of uh, vigor. Uh, these fish, they might take you 5, 10 minutes to come in, so they might be exhausted. So more often than not, when they are, don't put them in the water and push them back and forth. Um, the, the, the fish are built that the water comes in their mouth and out their gills. It's not supposed to come backwards through their gills. So when you push it back and forth, that's not um, how they're built um, and it's not good for them. So what I do is just find a little current on, you know, on the side of the stream where I can hold the fish in the current. Just literally keep it there. Hold it by the base of the tail. Um, keep it moving in that fast current or medium fast current. And uh, when it decides it's ready to kick off, it'll kick off. Um, so whether that's salmon or steelhead or any big fish that you might catch after you've exhausted it a little bit, hold it in the current, let the current revive it. When it's ready, you'll know and it'll kick off. Um, if it doesn't, keep working on it. And if all of a sudden it's floating downstream, well, that's your harvest. 
If you don't typically harvest fish and you have something floating belly up, harvest that fish um, rather than letting it float down and be wasted. So in my opinion, uh, you were at fault to that. Uh, you have a daily limit for a reason. Take it home, find someone else, come into the shop. I've got plenty of people that'll take a fish like that um, rather than just letting it float belly up down the stream. Um, I've seen far too many fish float down towards me that I've tried to revive or put back in and that someone else had had, uh, had caught farther upstream. Um, so we talked a little bit about gear. Uh, we'll talk uh, clothing. So there's a phrase that says cotton kills when it gets cold, whether you're hunting or fishing, and that is very appropriate here too when, when the cold weather kicks in. So for me, I'm running some sort of um, adjust this a bit. moisture wicking material underneath both socks, uh, base layer, pants, and shirt. Um, so moisture wicking socks are so huge because when your feet get cold, you're done. So I wear like a polypropylene uh, underlayer and then wool, um, wool my whole way up if I can. So I've got, I had an ugly sweater contest a number of years ago that this wool sweater was like this thick and I was like, oh, this thing is hideous. Um, and it was, but I wear it steelhead fishing all winter long <laughs> uh, because it's just so stinking warm. So, so cotton holds in moisture and moisture kills um, where you want that moisture wicking and the, the wool will pull it away um, and actually keep you a lot warmer. So you can wear less layers, with, less layers with wool than having all these extra layers on. And you wanna breathe. So whether we're in uh, neoprene waders or breathable waders, um, you wanna be able to breathe and kind of have that moisture pulled off of your body and released from there. Or cotton, even like cotton socks are just uh, atrocious. Um, so don't wear those ever and get a good pair of uh, wool. I'm trying to find probably an alpaca uh, sock this winter which is you're gonna spend like 30 bucks on a pair of socks, but they're worth it. So put that on your Christmas list this year. Um, so that's great. Um, have an extra layer of clothing in the car because falling in the water happens. <laughs> Brian's over here laughing. Um, it happens. So you don't wanna be soaking wet in 25, 30 degree weather and have the risk of hypothermia. Have an extra pair of clothes, even if it's just jeans and a hoodie in the car where you can, you know, take your wet clothes off, have some dry clothes, turn the heater on and, you know, drive home. Whether you want to go fishing, back fishing or not is up to you. But usually if you're falling in and that's cold and you're soaked down to your socks, then get dry, go home. Um, so having an extra pair of, uh, you know, I've even had somebody who's, you know, gone in for, you know, releasing a fish or, you know, they're trying to get a, a hook off the bottom and they've soaked their shirt up to their shoulder, like, Go change out, you know, have have an extra hoodie or something like that or an extra fleece in the car that you can get out of those wet clothes whenever it's uh, super cold. So that's very, very important. Um, I always keep an extra rod or two in the car because these fish break rods. Um, I have the luxury of having a couple extra rods more than everybody else as there's, you know, like 15, 20 rods hanging on the, on the wall right in front of me. Um, but, you know, even if you just have your five or six weight trout or bass rod as a backup, have it there. Um, because rods break both for salmon and steelhead, uh, sometimes due to just the fish being bit big and a lot of times because of stupidity at the end of the day too. You know, you, you grab the rod and, and, you know, turn your nine foot seven weight into a, you know, six foot three weight because this is now where all the pressure point is rather than here on the butt section. So I don't ever want to see people do that even though I see it all the time. Um, so rods break. You know, you, you catch a fish and lay it on the ground to take a picture and stand up and step on it. Um, had that happen to me uh, with my rod, but someone else stepped on it when they were taking a picture. It was in Alaska, so it made it worse. Um, so I've got all kinds of stories, but to have a backup rod, even if it's only, um, you know, a five or six weight. I've got a buddy of mine who's fished for steelhead for 30 years, and that's all he uses is a five weight. So that's, uh, that's kind of a must to have. Um, if not, you're going to be running around Erie and there's not really any fly shops up there to try to find a backup in the, in the last minute. Um, other gear that you need, I don't think there's really a whole lot. Have plenty of flies, um, have tippet, have leaders, and uh, go up and have some fun and catch some fish. So we've covered the gear. If you have any other questions, just shoot us a message on any of our social media pages or ask it here live on the, uh, on the Facebook page here. Um, next step is where do we go? 
So I'm going to preface this bit of advice by saying don't go to anywhere else on this website besides this section because it's awful. FishErie.com. So go to FishErie.com. Don't look at the message board because it's a bunch of people yelling at people like us going up and fishing and spending money up there. And the, the reports are usually not very truthful and with the same guys. But there's a map section on fisherie.com. So you can go on there, has every single um, tributary there, parking areas, private areas that you can't fish, um, and it really breaks down the water really well for you. So there's a map for every single tributary. There's like a dozen when you really factor it in that are fishable waters um, all through Erie. And when you look at it, it's only, it's not very much actual um, property. Um, that Lake Erie runs into Pennsylvania there. So we have a lot of tributaries in Pennsylvania. Some are very small, some are very big. Um, <laughs> that's okay, you can look it back, uh, Edward here. Uh, we're gonna repost this so it won't just be live, we'll post it back to our, our page later so that you can go check it out. Um, so you didn't miss a whole lot yet, but anybody who wants to watch this again and fast forward through some sections and just pick up something again, um, you guys can go ahead and check that out later. So we've we've talked about gear, but one of the things we really haven't talked about with gear is flies. So for me, I'm using streamers, egg patterns, and nymphs. Don't really pack my dry fly box. There's not a reason for it. And I'm sure you can go out and catch a couple steelhead on dries. I know some people who do it, um, but leave those boxes at home. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, for me, I carry, people laugh at me, I carry somewhere upwards of a thousand flies sometimes when I'm on the creek. Um, I am an over-preparer because I usually fish with people who are under-preparers. <laughs> so I've got people, hey, yeah, when you see my fly boxes here and, and how many flies that we have. Most of my boxes are things that I've tied. Like I've been working, I just started a new pattern with ecstasy. So this is some flies that I've tied in the last couple days. Um, so most of my flies are hand tied by me, um, not ones that I've pulled out of the box most. Um, so I have kind of a theory on what flies work best generally in, in each of what I call three seasons of steelhead fishing. So early in steelhead fishing, when they're coming in now, so you know we're mid-September all the way through potentially the end of October when the water and air temperatures start to drop a lot more. Um, I think fishing streamers can be very, very productive because these fish have spent the last three years in Lake Erie and they're eating round gobies, emerald shiners, um, fry from bass, walleye, um, perch. So they're used to eating bait fish. That's probably the vast majority of their diet when they're in the lake. Um, so when we throw something that they've been eating for the last three years, we've got a better opportunity for them to recognize something that looks like what they've been eating um, and go and eat it themselves. So uh, I love throwing streamer patterns early on, whether I'm just dead drifting them, whether I'm swinging them, whether I'm fast retrieving them, uh, streamers can work very, very well early in the season. So people always say, well, what streamers and what colors? If I was stuck with three colors for the rest of my life in all of fishing, it would be white, black, and olive. Um, for steelhead, occasionally that can change. I there's some days where the super bright chartreuse, pinks, purples, reds can work well. Um, but keep it simple, you know, get some whites, get some blacks, get some olives, and those will catch fish all year round. But early in the season, they can work very, very well. Uh, when you look at most bait fish, they've got those basic colors in them. You, know, you don't see too many blue bait fish out there, um, even though blue is like the color of the last couple years for whatever reason. Um, so your typical, I like anything with a lot of movement in my streamer patterns. Um, marabou and rabbit zonkers or squirrel zonkers are huge for me. They've got a lot of flow to them and a lot of movement. So woolly buggers, um, uh, slump busters, uh, like the white deaths, anything like that um, is a huge pattern for me to use. Hook sizes. Anywhere from tens to fours, I think is good. Well, sixes and eights are pretty typical for me, but occasionally you want to go smaller. Occasionally you can get away with a bigger one in higher water. Um, so those are the streamer patterns that I typically like. Keep it simple at the end of the day. You don't have to get into these unless you really want to 
swing double-handed flies and get intruder styles in there. We, that's a whole different topic. Um, but for Great Lakes fishing, just keep it simple with those. In terms of egg patterns, there's a ton of egg patterns out there. So you've got glow bugs, which are, here, I've got some here, so I'll kind of show you as I'm walking through. Just a pom-pom of a, of a fly. Um, this one has a bead head on it. Let's see if I can remember where to put it, put it back to. And then we've got, uh, out of the same similar material, you can use egg yarn. You can also use what's called Angora, which is the same, which is the original uh, material used. So a sucker spawn, when suckers actually spawn, they come out in clumps um, and they, that one. and they do come into the water in Lake Erie in huge numbers in the early, early spring, like March. Um, so you can fish sucker spawns and really do well for the fish that are going back into the lake after they spend all winter there. So you've got that, you've got the same tie, but with a different material called crystal meth. It's a, um, the material is called a sparkle braid. So it's just a couple bumps into one fly. And then there's a handful of other egg flies out there. Um, Estes is a material that it's like a sparkle chenille almost, and you just wrap it on the hook. And when it gets wet, it just looks like a translucent ball. Uh, I use a lot of that for salmon, not so much for steelhead. Um, I don't know why, but I feel like I just have more success on salmon than steelhead. I've even created a pattern over the years. Let's see if I can grab one without making too much of a mess. Um, I've taken an Estes egg and then put a squirmy worm on the back of it. So that's a, just a combo pattern to get a little bit extra movement out of the eggs. I don't know if it really matters at the end of the day, but it's a fun little pattern to, um, to just mix it up and show the fish something different. Um, in terms of egg colors, uh, most of the natural colors of these eggs uh, are like a an amber yellow orange color so i try to keep to that uh my favorite color pattern that i personally use is this one here uh, some friends of mine dub it the natural so this is um egg colored and then it has a salmon uh dot on it so this is probably out of all the egg patterns that i fish this is my confidence fly i catch more fish on that than most of my other colors um, I've, I just saw a poll on one of the steelhead pages the other day of favorite egg color. I think pink was one and orange was two. Um, so pink, orange, chartreuse, uh, yellow, cream colored, I think is up there too. Um, so there's a thousand different colors. We probably have 15, 20 different colors of eggs here. Um, so use eggs. The other thing that a lot of people are using in uh, both fly fishing, center pinning, even on spinning rods are beads. So we'll talk about that. Uh, is it legal in Pennsylvania? Everything that I've read is yes. So I've had some people, oh, it's illegal because you can't fish a bear hook. It's not in the rules anywhere. So you show me where that is in there and then we'll talk. But everything that I have uh, read and talked to other people actually who are important with this um, you can fish a bead. So what a bead is, is it's exactly what that is. It's a clear bead. Uh, we have plenty of them in the shop. There used to be over there, but we moved them. We just got you know, probably 200 packages in today. And all you do is you take this bead, you put it on your line. Um, we have, uh, some people use toothpicks, but there's a silicone peg that you peg it about an inch and a half above a hook. So this was made popular out in Alaska because there's so many natural eggs in the system that when fish were eating egg patterns, they were gut hooking themselves a lot. So what happens here is you've got this hook about two inches above the egg. So here's the egg and here's the hook. And they take the egg and the hook gets them in the corner of the mouth. So they were getting far less good hooks that way and far more safe hooks in the corner of the mouth um, by pegging it about an inch and a half, two inches above the, the hook. So people are saying, oh, that's snagging. Like, no, they're actually taking a bait. You're just hooking them differently. Um, so that's, that's as much as I'll cover on there. So we've got, uh, we've got that all covered there. Um, in terms of nymphs, uh, for me, I've got both ends of the spectrums. I've got the, the dull colors, your 
Prince nymphs, pheasant tails, hares ears, both unweighted and weighted. Usually I throw a bead head on most of my steelhead flies because I want to get them down. Maybe even some lead wraps underneath. Um, and then I've got flashy stuff. I've got um, purple nymphs. I've got, you know, stuff with a lot of wire and flash on them. Um, I've got stuff in blues and chartreuses and things like that. So there are days they want the dull colors and there are days they want the flashy stuff. So I kind of, a lot of times that's why I love fishing two flies is you're going to fish and all of a sudden you pick up a fish on this one and you pick up another fish on this one and you pick up one on that. But if you just keep getting fish on the same fly, throw two of those on or throw a similar one on of that color scheme, maybe an egg compared to your nymph. Um, you know, if all of a sudden they're hitting a bunch of purple nymphs, like throw a blue or purple or, you know, bright color egg pattern on and, and see if uh, you pick up a couple fish with that too. Um, so for me, I always fish my confident fly on top that I just love catching fish on. If it's a nymph, I love prince nymphs. I've cut a lot of steelhead on prince nymphs over the year, regular and uh, the psycho, psycho princes. And then on the bottom, usually if I'm not catching fish, I'm swapping that one out throughout the day. If I'm really not catching fish, I might throw them both out, but I'd rather just flip one out. So I, I put the fly that I have the most confidence in on the top and then swap out the ball, swap out the bottom, excuse me. You can also throw streamers in there too. So you can dead drift streamers just like everything else. A woolly bugger, um, the white death streamer that everybody loves up here that Jeff Blood kind of created. It's just a zonker pattern with a hot spot on the back end. Um, it's actually, the original intent was for that to be dead drifted like a, an emerald shiner that just got washed out. Um, so it's not really supposed to be retrieved like some people do. Um, so you can just drift that, whether it's under an indicator or tight lining. Um, you can fish that in tandem. You can fish two of those. You can fish, you know, an olive oily bugger and a white death uh, together if you want to. Um, so there's no wrong way to do it. The fish are just picky. No offense to any women watching this right now. Um, but I say steelhead are like women. They change their mind what they want to eat, and then they change it again soon afterwards, every single day, sometimes multiple times a day. Um, you know, you ask a woman where they want to eat. Oh, where do you want to eat? Oh, I don't know. Where do you want to eat? Well, why don't we go over here? I don't want to eat there. Like, okay. Well, you know, that's the way these steelhead are at times. And it, Brian's over here laughing. So much truth to it. That, uh, you know, they might, in the first thing in the morning, they might be chasing down streamers because they, you know, they're, they're coming sh fresh out of the lake. And then they might be hanging around for a while and they might be picking off small nymphs. And then all of a sudden they might start spawning and we're gonna have eggs. Um, so back to what I talked about before, streamers early in the season, that's really what these fish are keying in on in my opinion. Mid season, so probably October, November, parts of December, they're truly spawning there. Um, so throwing a lot of egg patterns during that two, two and a half months um, is key for me. They're gonna take streamers in the spring before they go back to the lake and eggs before the river eggs dropping. But for me, it's just like matching the hatch. You wanna get these, um, these flies and these fish's faces that is something that they're used to eating. So egg patterns in that October, November, December timeframe. If you can visually see in some of the shallow water two fish pairing up and making a red, a lot of times you'll see them literally kind of shake like that and they're dropping eggs and, and fertilizing them. We won't go into the birds and the bees and the fishes today. <laughs> That's a different talk. You'll see some other fish staging behind them, picking up eggs. Um, so if you see a pair uh, paired up, uh, try to hit right behind them. And a lot of times you'll pick up fish behind them that are picking up eggs as those fish are spawning. And then last but not least is nymphs. I fish nymphs through through the whole year, but mainly that late season, December, January, February, March, um, because there's nymphs in the system. These fish are staying all year. Unlike salmon, steelhead don't die after they spawn. So they're in there. There's a lot of stoneflies. There's a lot of caddis. There's some may a few mayflies in those systems. Um, so go fish nymphs throughout the winter. Get some heavy nymph patterns. Throw two or three of them. Um, you know, like I said, I usually max out at two. And a lot of times those fish are picking up those because that's what they're now eating until they go back to the lake again if they last all winter and don't get picked up on a rope. Um, yes, Dennis uh, chimed in, said sometimes the, the fish caught behind the pair is a competing male. 
So if you've got a, a female that's ready to drop eggs and you've got a male beside it, sometimes you've got a male behind or sometimes multiple fish there too. Um, so you can pick up those fish that are uh, trying to eliminate their competition, um, but also uh, it's a food source for them too. So there's multiple reasons why you're gonna catch some fish um, when you're looking at, uh, at that. If you've never seen spawning fish before, um, when you talk about trout and you see the reds, like don't walk on them, blah, 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 there's very little reproduction that happens in Lake Erie. So uh, the state stocks upwards of two million fish a year. That's a lot of fish because there's very little success. There was actually an article that just showed that they found the first spawning lake trout um, par, which was about yay big in the article this year. Um, I know a few spots that you're gonna see some natural reproducing, I would say, less than 1% of the steelhead that you see that come back are wild fish that were born there. Almost every single one of them in Pennsylvania um, is, is, uh, is a stocked fish. Now I know there's rough estimates in Lake Ontario where I go that the king salmon, it's close to 50% um, are naturally reproducing. So there's enough of the right substrate there um, for them to, to, to successfully um, reproduce where the slate without a whole lot of gravel um, isn't, uh, isn't adequate for them to be able to do that there. Um, lost my place of where I was going. So we've talked a little bit about flies and through the seasons. Um, like I said, this is just a general rule. So we've got streamers early, eggs middle, nymphs at the end. You can flip flop and use all three all season long, but I feel like in my history of 15 plus years of steelhead fishing, you kind of keep to that and if that's not working, change it. But that's what they're eating naturally during each of those seasons, in my opinion. You'll still see fish potentially spawning late in the season, fish that have just come into the lake in December and January, you know, from, from the lake uh, into the streams that are gonna spawn. Um, but typically the biggest pushes of fish will, they'll come in, they'll spawn together, and then they'll just winterize, they'll hang out all winter. Um, so we've talked about flies, we've talked about kind of catching fish. Well, let's talk a little bit more about catching these fish and how they're so different. So the biggest thing that I talk about with steelhead is these fish move, they move a ton. Um, you might be there in a day where the water uh, has risen up a little bit more, risen, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, Dennis says, love the nuke egg in fast water. Yeah, uh, you know, everybody has, it's so funny. I wanna, t I wanna touch on that. Everybody has like their confidence pattern. Like I said, this, this egg pattern is just huge for me. Um, I'll go up there, I could talk to 100 people and probably get 99 answers as to what their favorite confidence fly is for steelhead. That being said, these fish eat almost anything. Um, you can throw a cigarette butt on a, on, a, on a hook and catch a steelhead, I'm sure. But that being said, there are definitely times where they're eating something more often than something else or they might be taking nymphs or bright colors or streamers or different types of presentation. Um, so don't be afraid to change things up if you're not having success. So let's talk about uh, targeting these fish and how to have the best success of catching them. So these fish are moving. Uh, the, the greatest illustration I give, and I'm not a long distance runner, is if I went out and ran a half marathon, because um, there's no way I'm finishing a full, and a half marathon is probably gonna take me 10 hours to run 13 miles. Um, when I'm done, I am passing out on the floor with a full bottle of water and probably a beer and as much food as I can shove in my face because I'm gonna die. Now these fish, take that for a grain of salt, are kind of doing the same thing. They're coming up and they're running through some of this water that might only be that deep. Um, they're moving two, three, five, ten miles in a day. So when you come up to a pot of fish that's in this deep, slow pool, those fish are doing what I would do after a half marathon. They're passed out there, recovering, waiting to make the next move up. Um, so you, you'll be drawn, and so many fishermen are, to these pools where there's going to be 30, 40, 50 fish in them, um, and they are lethargic and resting. And also that water isn't really conducive to fly fishing where we've got to use the current and drift, it in, drift our presentations into these fish. Um, so they're not active, they're resting more often than not, and they're not the fish to target. 
So you might have a huge pool that, you know, however big it is with 40, 50 fish, look at the tail outs and the heads of, the, of those sections. The faster water at the top of those pools and the, the water that's tailing out into the next riffle run or faster water, if you find four or five fish here and four or five fish there, those 10 fish are gonna be 10 times more likely to eat than the 50 fish sitting in the pool. Um, if I stress anything in all of this presentation, it's that, is that you need to find the active fish because those are the fish that are going to eat. Not only are they going to eat, but you've got a better opportunity to present a fly in those situations appropriately. Where if you've got a fly when the water's low and clear that's drifting just this fast down towards them, they get a chance more often, they come like this and those fish literally like dive out of the way because they see it coming for 30 seconds and they're not hungry anyways. Where these fish in the faster water, they're kind of moving in and out and hanging in the currents and something's coming faster and they're gonna make a split decision whether to eat it or not. So they have less time to react of whether it's an eat or not eat, but also they're more active fish. They've got some energy moving too. So you wanna be able to present in the right types of water there. Um, one of the biggest rules up there is don't leave fish to find fish. Uh, you might go into a parking lot and there's 10, 15 other cars there and you find a situation where there's a big pot of fish in some fast water um, and you're not catching them, switch your flies, switch your weight. In my opinion, the first thing you should do is change your weight. Um, so if the fish are here and your flies are floating above them and you throw a split shot on and gets in, in their current, they're going to eat more often than not. Um, if you're using a strike indicator, that's your second move. So add weight, subtract weight, move your indicator up or down. If you think you need more depth, less, less depth, adjust your indicator there. So those are your first two steps. Like I said, I use two flies most of the time up there. If you do that and you're drifting 30 times and not catching any fish or not seeing any fish kind of make a move towards your flies, maybe adjust a fly until you start to see something that's actually catching some fish. If you're not catching any fish there, two flies. And if you're not doing that, if you're really not catching fish, try a different technique. If you're drifting nymphs and you're seeing some fish in the fast water and you're not catching anything, take a step upstream through a streamer on and swing it through the current. You know, change your presentation. Because all of a sudden you're gonna go, if you leave those fish, you might walk a mile and not find that situation with active fish anymore. Now, if there's two fish there, that's kind of the, you know, okay, I can leave two fish to hopefully find 10 fish. Um, but if you find good fish in good water, more often than not, eventually they're going to eat something. Um, so keep trying things until they work. And when it works, repeat the process. So if there's two fish in that fast water and you hook or catch them both, um, they might not eat again, move to a different section, use that same technique and try to catch more fish. Um, until something stops working, keep using it. You know, all, you know, you, you go up and you, you have a, you know, you catch three or four fish in the morning, and then you know for an hour you're not catching any fish. Like, oh, this isn't working anymore. Like, keep keep trying. You know, eventually up there, that's why I carry so many flies. Is I just change things all the time until something works, and then I just keep trying to repeat that process of finding two or three fish in that water that I want to. Uh, I'm successful in and finding that type of water with fish in it and keep walking. There are days that I don't move a quarter mile from where I am and there's days I put four, five, six, seven miles in throughout the day. I'm just trying to find those fish that are gonna be active players and passing on the fish that everybody else is trying to knock in the face with a fly in the, in the soft frog water, we call it. So those are the most important tips that I will give you in terms of finding success uh, catching fish. Um, I personally don't like strike indicators. For most beginners, uh, floating strike indicators, it's a great way to do it. Um, I will use strike indicators if I'm casting a decent distance out. Um, or if I'm in some medium water, not that super slow water, but something where uh, a, a fish is gonna take and I'm not really gonna catch those subtle changes in my line. Um, so I, I usually uh, tight line nymph, through most of mine, that's why I really use a 10-foot rod is I get more reach and more ability to get into certain seams with a 10-foot rod. And then um, it's also good line control whenever you're throwing streamers and swinging streamers too. 
Um, but if I'm casting out, like I've got a, a fast run that's 20 feet out, that's when I'll throw an indicator on um, because I can't tight line nymph 20 feet out. It's not gonna work well. So bring some big indicators because sometimes you're gonna throw, you might be drifting streamers, you might be throwing nymphs with two or three split shots on them. So these little dinky like foam fold in half ones, like those aren't gonna work here, those aren't gonna fly. You know, get the big, um, what are they, half, half inch or even three quarter inch thingamabobbers or any sort of floats like that, corks, um, big foam or um, uh, yarn indicators that are just gonna float really well for you and float a couple big flies through some fast current potentially as well. Um, so leave your little tiny indicators for trout at home and, and bring some big stuff. Um, there's several different riggings too. So you can run what we call an inline rig, which is just your regular leader to a fly, regular leader material, you know, tippet material to a fly. You can also run um, a blood or a surgeon's knot and leave a tag end and have kind of two independently flowing flies. Um, so there's a couple different riggings and a lot of different ways. George Daniel is a great guy to look at for some of that. He does a lot of tactical nymphing and his YouTube channel is fantastic. Um, Dennis, yes, great point. Let me touch on that. Lots of people walk past fish and don't even know it. Uh, one piece of gear that I didn't touch on in my gear talk is polarized sunglasses. Uh, for me, I wear two colors, but I seem to wear one more than another is like a yellow or an amber lens. In the dark overcast days, which we see a lot in Pennsylvania, fortunately, unfortunately, those brighten things up for me and, and give me the ability to see better. So, you know, Dennis talks about walking past fish. For me, if I see a section of water that I think, um, you know, I'm talking about those, the heads of the pools and the tail outs or just a fast riffler run, you'll see me walk up, put my hands behind my back and just watch. I won't even throw, um, I won't even throw a cast in there and I'm just gonna watch. These fish, they're 22, 25, 30 inches long and they hide in that shale so well and they color themselves well. So I'll, I'll just sit there and watch and watch and watch and watch and watch and all of a sudden you'll see a tail movement somewhere. Or as they're in the system a little longer, their cheeks get red and all of a sudden you'll see a little bit of red move. Um, and usually when you see one in that little bit of water, you're gonna see two or three fish too. So, you know, you might, if the water's this deep, like go and, and slow, walk past it. If there's some fast water, even if it's I've seen fishes backs out of the water um, that I've seen people walk past because they're not willing to sit there and look in that water and really take some time um, to figure out whether there's fish or not. Um, Dennis also talked about uh, wading through fishy water. Um, I, don't, I don't cross a stream unless it's a bad section of water. Um, and I don't just walk up and fish too. So I usually, and I do this trout fishing too, I'll I won't tie a fly on and I'll stand on the stream bank and look and see if I see a rise, see if I see a fish move, or see if I see a bug come off. Um, look at cobwebs and stuff on trout fishing. The same thing kind of goes for steelhead, is that, you know, walk up to the bank and just evaluate that hole first. The run that you think might hold fish, if you look, it might be five feet closer to you and you might walk right in the middle of it. There might be some fish laying in this section fish that first and then hit the section that's five feet farther out and work your way through there. Um, so, you know, don't just all of a sudden trudge through the stream without sitting there and taking your time. You know, it's, it's a, uh, you're doing your homework to prepare for the real thing. So sit there, um, take your polarized sunglasses and just scan the water. And it's, I take a lot of pride in catching that fish that 30 people walk past like, I didn't think there was a fish there. Well, you didn't take the time to look at it. Um, so take your time, wear a good pair of sunglasses. Bright, bright sunny days, I like a, a brown or a gray lens. Uh, the overcast days and uh, the low light situations, I like a, like a yellow or an amber color. Brightens things up and takes the glare off of the water. Um, that all being said, there's times it's bit me in the butt where I'm like, oh, there's a red cheek and I'm casting at it for 20 minutes and realize it's a leaf. Um, like, it happens. Um, but I'd rather be on that end of the caution scale than, you know, walking through a section and, oh crap, I just spooked three fish that I almost stepped on. Um, so take your time and, and uh, if you find a piece of water that possibly can hold fish and you don't see them immediately, 
you know, just take another minute or two and, uh, and keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, in my opinion with that too, uh, Erie's crowded. Uh, I say, you know, the TV killed the radio star while well, internet ki killed Erie steelhead fishing for me. Um, I've been fishing it for probably 15, 20 years now. And, oh, it's not the way it used to be. I sound like an old guy right now. Um, but there's so many more people up there. So in my opinion, if I'm going fishing up there, I'm bringing people with me. Um, I rarely fish up there by myself. But uh, that, that serves a couple purposes. First, you're hanging out with people that you actually like, hopefully. And if you're taking, if I'm guiding you, then maybe you don't like me anyways, but I'll teach you something. Um, but then some people keep a net and some people don't i think if you're really planning on catch and release a net is important and when you're fishing with multiple people having at least one net there when someone hooks a fish the other person can net it release the hook take a quick picture release the fish back in um, it really lessens the amount of time um, that that fish is really going to get worn out because you want them to go attempt to spawn whether it works or not um, and you don't want them to die off from exhaustion. So a net really works and having multiple people there with you rather than you know giving the, the old boot onto the bank trick um, if you're going to release that fish. Let's touch on this before we go any further on keeping fish. And let me get a drink because I've been talking for a while now. Um, keeping fish. So the limit up there is three fish. I see a lot of people out there that'll go keep their three fish, go back to the truck, keep three more, do it over and over again. Um, this is all my opinion from here. I don't think they taste very good. <laughs> so um, people go in, they're like, oh, salmon, you're going to catch salmon. They've got to taste so great. Well, these fish taste like what they eat. Where the salmon that are ocean run from Alaska and West Coast and everywhere else that we're really getting them, or going out to the ocean and eating crustaceans and shrimp and you know other things in the ocean that taste good so it makes them taste good so when you get these bright red salmon fillets from alaska that's a reflection of what they eat we're going to get some pinkish red but usually gray um, meat colors um, and they're out there eating minnows so their food source is going to create what they taste like they're okay at best um, but not what I prefer. If you love them, by all means, go ahead and keep some fish. Um, the limit's three. In my opinion, if you're going to keep three, catch your third one, put it on the rope, and stop fishing. Because if all of a sudden you, you, you know, gut hook a fish or put one in their, their gills, I had a guy the other day say that he hooked one in the lungs and he just got put over the rails on hooking a fish in the lungs. <laughs> um, and that fish dies, you're over the limit legally. So don't make that happen. So if you're gonna keep two, keep three, and you wanna fish all day, keep two, and then wait till your last time, and you know keep your third one, and then stop fishing from there. If you're keeping a fish, um, ice is key, and bleeding them out is key. Um, so if you're actually gonna keep a fish, carry a knife on you, slit their gills, uh, make a mess of them, and bleed them out. And then once they're bled out, throw them on ice. If it's cold out, you can throw them on the bank in the snow. Um, but once you do that, that will, uh, there's a lot of the gamey taste in the blood. So when you bleed them out, that helps. When you take them home, you can also brine them in either a milk brine or a saltwater brine. That helps pull uh, some of the blood out as well and uh, gets a better tasting fish. Um, there's a handful of places up there to get them cleaned. And uh, you can clean them yourself, but when you can pay someone two or three bucks to clean them for you, that's a good investment in my opinion. Uh, Poor Richards is probably the most popular place up there. Um, you know, the best recipe out there. Uh, so Dennis says, I really like eating them. Here's a recipe for you, Dennis. I'm sure you've heard this a thousand times because I know who you are, but so you take a cedar plank, take the fish, flay them open, a little bit of lemon, a little bit of seasoning, put them in the oven for 350 for about a half an hour, take it out, throw the fish in the garbage and eat the cedar plank. Um, so... <laughs> If you haven't heard that before, you can use it later. Um, so smoking them is good. I usually keep, the only fish I keep a year, I keep one, I smoke it and bring it to a Christmas Eve dinner and my you know, my extended family loves it. Um, so smoking them can be good. Baking them, putting them on. <laughs> you got the, I got the, the laugh from Dennis. Um, 
Uh, grilling them occasionally can be very good as well. Uh, so I've used anything from a Cajun, uh, poor Richards will swap out your fish up there. So you can take a fish that you've harvested for the day, take it to them, they'll fillet it and they'll swap out for a fish of, of appropriate size that they've already smoked. Um, I think the cleaning is like two or three bucks and the fish is like 12 to swap them out. Um, you can also buy their seasoning packets up there, which I've done. So they give you like a Ziploc baggie full of Cajun seasoning. Their Cajun's phenomenal. Um, and I've done it on my own in my own smoker. Um, so there's a lot of ways to do it. And I'll take uh, the smoked fish and uh, Zatter's fish fry is also good too. I'll either just take that and throw that on a cracker or I'll make like a cream cheese spread with it and use that on crackers too, which can be really, really good. Um, so, like I said, it's not something that I wanna eat every single week, but I'll pull a fish or two out here and there and, and take them home and put them on the smoker or grill them or, you know, there's a lot of different ways for them. Um, that's all I'm gonna talk about on that subject. If you want some more recipes, then that's what Pinterest is for. <laughs> Uh, so we've touched on that um, one thing on gear don't wear felt boots a lot of felt is being outlawed out there but if you are going to be in below freezing temperature and snow when you're wearing felt your felt goes from about that thick to about that thick um, Nang even eats them now yeah that's uh, that's uh, let's see order number like uh, N6 on there make sure you get it in number six spicy I think he has catfish on the, on the menu now too. <laughs> uh, just joking, just joking. Um, so when you're wearing felt, snow sticks to the felt. And then you wade in there and that snow turns to ice. So now you're wearing platform shoes with two inches of ice underneath your, your felt bottoms. Um, so I wear rubber Vibram soles and usually put uh, studs in there to help with the ice and the slate up there. Um, so that's usually what I wear up there. Don't wear felt, you'll, you'll feel, uh, you'll feel like an idiot because I did it before years and years ago before I knew any better. <laughs> Fran's like, yep, me too. Um, so anybody have any more questions before I move forward? There's a few people live on here. Um, some of the other little things that I'll talk about, um, we'll talk about some of the streams up there and I'll talk about stream conditions. Let's touch on that next. Uh, when you look at Lake Erie, the water basin that runs into Lake Erie is very small. So when you're watching like the USGS uh, um, gauges, so there's gauges on a tributary of, of elk, let's touch on that, and on walnut right by the mouth. Um, the tributary of elk is Brandy Run, I think I forget, it's been nine months since I fished for them, so I don't remember. But it's... It doesn't, I like elk, or I like the walnut gauge rather than elk. So the gauge will show stream height, it'll show temperature and cubic feet per second. Um, why do steelheads sometimes porpoise? I'll talk about that after I catch this. Um, so the stream gauges for me, ideally, I like to fish when the walnut gauge is anywhere between 50 and 200, and that's a general rule for me um i fished it when it's higher and done well i fished it when it's lower but that's kind of the the sweet spot for me so when you look at these gauges a lot of times you'll see because of the low the small water basin there you'll see a huge spike and then two days later it's back to low and clear it's back to 12 cubic feet per second which is barely moving um, and the reason for this is there's so little water running into lake erie everything else is running south eventually into the mississippi and into the gulf um, so we always like rising water until it's unfishable and we always like dropping water and those movements are going to be our prime sections. So in this, you know, this huge peak to 600 CFS and all the way back down to 20 again, um, right in the middle of the mountain peaks there, um, is where I like to fish when it's moving up and when it's dropping down, that's where you're going to have the most success. Um, in terms of holding water. Uh, the streams will hold better once the leaves are off the trees. Those, those trees suck up a lot of water. So when they don't have leaves to feed anymore, um, the, those water levels will be a little bit more sustaining. They'll take a few more days between, they, between them dropping all the way down. So I like to fish those sections, but my also rule of thumb is 
there's different sizes of water. There's the mile, some mile streams are, you know, this big, and then you've got elk that's this big. Is the rule of thumb is that big water takes longer to dirty and longer to clear. And small water is quicker to dirty and quicker to clear. So you might be fishing, one of my favorite stories about fishing like this is, we were fishing a smaller body of water and it was raining on us. Pardon me, we were, it was raining on us. And all of a sudden, it went and blew out in like an hour or two in front of us. And one guy's like, let's go to Elk and beat the flows by the mouth. And I was like, what do you mean beat the flows? And everybody thought he was an idiot. And we came down there and all that water still hadn't hit the mouth from all the tributaries and all the rain driving in. And we had like two more hours of fishing at the bottom of Elk because it was, it was taking that amount of water because it was a bigger, bigger stream, bigger river and spreading it out more evenly. You know, there was a rock in front of me and all of a sudden the rock was disappearing more and more and more. And when it got over the rock, I'm like, okay guys, it's time to go, the water's coming. Um, but we went, you know, we went from being blown out to the small stream to us catching fish for about two hours um, until the water caught up and, and blew out elk and then went back next to the campfire and had a bite to eat and a beer. Um, so don't be afraid because of that rule to change up where you go. Um, we got some steelhead guide to, you know, Lake Erie or whatever um, books in. Um, and the stream maps on uh, fisherie.com are, are key. So if you're on a big piece of water and, and it's blown out, go to a little piece of water. Go hit Crooked or Raccoon, hit 12 mile, 7 mile, 8 mile, 16 mile, 20 mile, like all the streams up there. Go to the smaller streams. When a bigger unfishable, you might find a section of water that is better off. And then vice versa. If all of a sudden that's blown out, you might be able to find, you know, elk or walnuts fishing better. Um, walnut, the most fishable part of walnut is the project water, as we call it. There's a parking lot that fits 8 billion people in it. And everybody goes there and shoulder to shoulder. Um, but I just read an article a couple weeks ago that they, the state bought a section of land that used to be private right up before the falls. That, Guy used to come out and yell at people from being on his property. Apparently they bought that, and there's rumors of them putting a fish ladder in to get the fish above those. There's two waterfalls back to back that are like five, six feet tall and almost impassable for the fish. Um, so it'd be nice if we get a fish ladder in there that it would extend miles of fishable water. Um, why do steelhead sometimes porpoise? Um, there's been a couple theories on that. Um, I know that especially for salmon when they do that a lot of times you'll see huge king salmon jump out of the water and belly flop um, so I've heard that sometimes they're doing that when they come in the females their eggs when you harvest a female they'll come out as what's called skein just one big chunk of eggs um, and then eventually before they drop them it, they separate into single eggs and I've heard rumors that they come out and belly flop to help loosen those eggs out at times. Um, porpoising, and people say, oh, they're coming up for air in the slow water. Uh, I don't even know if I know the answer to that, but it's definitely not coming up for air. Um, you know, occasionally they're taking flies. I've seen some dry fly fish, some on accident, some on purpose. Um, every year you have fish that come up and hit your strike indicator, uh, throw a hook on it or throw a dry fly up there. <laughs> uh, maybe you'll catch a couple. Um, but porpoising, I'll have to look into that. That's probably the best question I've, I've seen on one of these. Um, the, in terms of tying flies for these, uh, tie and, and having flies in your box, have a bunch. Like you can see here, I just started these new ties. Um, there's actually a bead if you can look really closely in the middle of these. Um, so when this gets wet, it looks like a blood dot in the middle of them. So I've got like pink in the middle of that and orange in the middle of that. Um, I've got probably 30, 35 flies tied here that I've tied in the last couple days. Um, on a good day, I'll go through half of these uh, because you're hooking fish and snack them, snapping them off. If you foul hook a fish, um, first and foremost, confirm that it's foul hooked. A lot of times when we salmon fish, you'll hook a fish, it'll run, it'll jump in the air, it'll twist and turn, and you might have them in the mouth, but it looks like it's hooked in the tail because the line's wrapped on if you obviously are fishing a purple fly and there's a purple fly in the dorsal fin, snap it off. It's common courtesy to other people fishing around you to not fight a foul hooked fish. Um, and, uh, and the next person that catch them, hopefully will just take that, take that fly and put it back in their box. 
Um, but uh, you'll lose fish to snags, you'll lose fish to um, uh, taking foul hook fish off, and there's fish that are inevitably just gonna snap you off too. So on a really, really good day of fishing where you might hook 30, 40, 50, 60 fish, um, you might lose 20, 30 flies in a day like that. So come prepared. For me, I always have like a couple test patterns that I'm working on. And my confidence, confidence flies, I've got two or three dozen of each of those in each color. You don't have to be as crazy as me in doing all that, but I think it's important to, um, to have a decent amount. You know, we sell flies starting at 99 cents for all of our egg patterns, nymphs, dries. And then if you buy a half dozen, they're down to $5.50. So you save a little bit of money. Come in, buy a bunch of flies, you're gonna use them. Stock trout will eat them in the springtime too. Um, but uh, like I said, there's not really any shops up there anymore um, that are gonna be selling a lot of flies. And maybe, maybe that'll be fixed on the road. We won't talk about that right now. Um, so come in here, stock up, buy on our website, um, and you can, you can check out uh, all of our stuff there. We're adding a ton of stuff too. I've got an order of almost 100,000 flies being tied for us right now. Brian's eyes just got really big. Uh, that's including a lot of nymphs and egg patterns. Um, and then we'll probably put another 50,000 on order by the end of the year for a bunch of streamers and tungsten stuff. So we've got a lot of stuff in stock now and we've got a lot of stuff coming. Uh, so don't be afraid to ask to like, hey Ryan, I just want two dozen flies, what should I buy? I'll give you suggestions. Come into the shop, shoot us a message online, shoot us an email. Uh, we'll be more than happy to help you out with that. Um, in terms of fly boxes, I just did, we just started a podcast. If you haven't listened to those, uh, go ahead and check them out. Um, Apple's giving us a hard time as usual, so we're working on that. Google has them. They're on our Facebook page. Um, and then uh, they're on YouTube, so we have them uh, automatically posted to YouTube. And then they're sourced through Podbean. So if you have a Podbean account by chance, uh, we're on there. But we're trying to get them out to all these other places. We're working on Spotify and a couple other things as well getting those up so check those out but we talked about fly boxes there um for me i just love you know lightweight thin fly boxes that hold a ton of flies something like this this holds like easily 200 flies um and just keep a ton of them in there i like keeping mine fairly organized like i've got um our slim boxes in uh, all my yarn eggs are in one. All of my sparkly eggs, like my crystal meth and my estas, are in another. I've got boxes with nymphs, boxes with streamers. So when I say I carry a thousand flies, sometimes I've got 200 in a box and I've got four or five boxes on me. Um, you might think I'm crazy until you run out of what's working and I give you a couple. Uh, so I'm always doing things like that. That's why I do that too. Um, Besides that, I think we've kind of covered just about everything in terms of uh, what will get you up there and get successful for you. Um, don't be afraid of the cold weather. Uh, I think the busiest time of year is going to be in the next two weeks all the way up until deer season. Uh, that's when the vast majority of, of, of steelhead anglers are going to come. They're like the opening day of trout season, guys, if you ask me. They go up there. They just want to catch a bunch of fish. Deer season comes in, a lot of them hunt, and they go out and pick up hunting. Cold weather comes in, they don't wanna fish in the cold weather. Um, there's still a decent amount of people out, um, but you're gonna see far less people when deer season kicks in and when the weather kicks in. You can catch steelhead from the day they come in to the day they leave. I don't care if it's 20 degrees outside and you break ice open on the, on the creeks, you'll be able to catch fish. Um, in the springtime, let's talk a little bit about that season too. Um, <laughs> we need to fish, Dennis, I like you. Um, I'm leaving some comments there. Uh, in the springtime, these fish who have survived the, the harvesters, you know, the, the yellow roped crew, um, will start to drop back. So if they're 10 miles up in the system, in the springtime, they'll slowly go back to the lake. They'll go back and maybe come back the next year and, you know, put a couple pounds on. Um, so you can still catch fish as they're coming back. Uh, the spring is a lot of fun and not a lot of people fish for them. And I won't give too many secrets, but there's not a ton of people watching. Um, best part of the spring is when they're dropping back and they're still getting really aggressive again. Uh, the bad time of the spring is when they stock the smolts. So they'll dump 50,000 smolts in and all you're doing is catching six inch fish every three casts. And that might sound like fun, but when you're trying to catch a 10 pound fish um, and you're catching a six ounce fish, uh, it's horrible. 
Um, also, some suckers run in in the early spring to spawn, and there's times where that can be very successful, like I talked about with our sucker spawns, and using those flies and catching those, those fish that are staging up behind um, the spawning fish, but also you're catching a bunch of suckers too. And then if you really wanna have some fun, you wait until the later season. Um, yes, uh, Dennis says he loves March. Uh, you can get into some of the smallmouth that come in too. So there's like an overlap of the smallmouth coming in and the steelhead dropping back. There's this magic window where you can catch both on streamers and get some four or five, six pound smallmouth and some you know, seven to 10 pound steelhead all in the same trip um, in this overlap. And you don't, you see 10%, if not less, of the people in the springtime that you see in the fall. Um, also, not giving away too many secrets is um, Ohio stocks of spring run fish. So those fish will start to come in in January, February, and March. They don't stay in as long because they're not there all winter, um, but you'll see fresh, rush, fresh run fin, fish in. So that's a tongue twister for me tonight. In Ohio, because they stock them, but we'll still get some fresh fish in in Pennsylvania too and then you'll get the drop back. So you'll see like a, a push of new fish coming in and the old fish going back. Um, so it can be a fun season. Um, so yeah, the, up until, I mean, I've seen videos of steelhead in the streams in May. So for me, I'm usually geared towards bugs at that point and uh, you know, really interested in what the hatches are going on. But if we've got a mild spring with a decent amount of water, those steelhead can be in in, in May and potentially even June. I know a few people that have hit, not in the same year, but have hit steelhead in all 12 months, um, which is maybe a, a lifetime goal to hit maybe in the next 10 to 20 years uh, if you're really a diehard steelhead angler. So um, try it out. Um, if, you, if you go up and you fail and you haven't figured it out, stop into the shop, I'll help you out. Um, I'm also a licensed guide and plan to do some steelhead guiding this fall. So if you want me to take everything that I've talked about here and actually apply it on stream for you and help you out, be more than happy to do that. We've got half day trips, full day trips. Um, and then we've got our salmon trip that is booked this year, but you can book it for next year that, you know, I'm on the water there for three full days fishing with you for Kings, Coho, Steelhead, Brown Trout, and um, the occasional Atlantic. Been up there for 10, 12 years and haven't even seen an Atlantic, let alone caught one, but um, they're in there, they tell me. So, uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed this. You've learned some things. If you have any questions, you know, put a comment below here. Shoot me an email. Stop in the shop. I'd be more than happy to help you out. And uh, we appreciate you guys checking everything out. If you have any questions, great. And thank you guys for your time. I'll see you guys soon.